I am Dan with Family White TV and this video is a video on how to build a home theater PC. But first a little bit of a dis disclaimer. A home theater PC is going to be a little... Hi, Dan from the future here. Since I recorded this video over a year ago, uh, while doing the editing for it I've uh, learned about some things such as the Nvidia Shield. Uh, if you're here for building a home theater PC, I'm going to recommend that you get one of these instead and maybe a network attached storage because this is going to be a lot more streamlined, a lot less clunky, and I'm going to be reviewing this pretty soon, but I've had good experiences with this so far just streaming the media from my existing home theater PC. So perhaps consider getting this and a network attached storage instead of building a home theater PC. Now if you want to build a home theater gaming PC, well then this, that's what this video is going to be. I'm re-editing the video to be more centric for a home theater gaming PC. If you really want to build a home theater PC and not use something like an Nvidia Shield, then go ahead and watch the video because uh, the, a lot of these principles are going to apply to that. You're just not going to need as powerful a processor and stuff like that. And speaking of a home theater gaming PC, I have started to get some parts. So I got my processor, motherboard, I got some memory, hard drive, all that kind of great stuff. Still don't have a graphics card. But go ahead and watch that build video. I might even live stream the build, and I'm also going to record a more edited, smoother uh, build video, which will hopefully turn out better than the build video for my existing home theater PC, which turned out horrible because I was a much younger, newer, more, I don't know, wasn't as good as you at YouTube back then. Hopefully I'm a little bit better this time. So watch for that video, and I'm going to let this guy get back to it here. Is this the right remote? Little bit fidgety with some of the software and so this is not for someone who's not comfortable dealing with computer software you see what could happen is you'll have your twenty thousand dollar eleven point four at most speaker set up all going and you'll have your home theater pc settings all dialed in and then a windows update is going to bork some of your settings then you're going to not realize this you're going to have a movie night one night you're going to start the movie and realize that you're only getting stereo sound at this point, you're going to have two options. One is stop the movie right at the beginning and troubleshoot your PC while your guests are getting a little bit annoyed at all this. Or you could let the movie play out twitching the entire time because you're only getting stereo sound. So realize that before getting into this, your most reliable option is to just use discrete sources such as Blu-ray players, UHD players, things like that. But if you do want to have a home theater PC, then this video is about how to build a home theater PC. So what is a home theater PC? Well, it's essentially a computer that is designed with home theater in mind. And there's four design criteria that you're going to want to focus on when building a home theater PC. First and foremost, it needs to be quiet, ideally dead silent. Next, it needs to not have a whole bunch of flashing lights in it that's going to be distracting. It needs to be capable of ideally 4K video playback. And also, it needs to have the ability to read physical media, such as Blu-rays and UHD Blu-rays. So let's talk about silence. A home theater computer needs to be as quiet as possible and ideally silent. The only thing in your theater that should be making any sound is your speakers. Now I'm going to assume that you've gone through all the other design criteria for designing a room that's going to be quiet, you have your HVAC quiet, you have all the other things quiet, you've disallowed people from bringing crinkly cellophane into the theater, and you have a nice quiet room. What you don't want to do is introduce a home theater computer that is going to be loud. You see, inside a home theater, noise needs to be kept to a minimum. When a movie has a silent passage that is there for suspense, the last thing you want to hear is the noise of a bunch of whirring fans inside your computer. This breaks our immersion and can be quite a distraction. Now in commercial cinemas, THX has a criteria that they judge cinemas by called NC30. And this is Noise Criteria 30. NC30 is a specification set up by the American National Standards Institute and it is a curve which represents the maximum allowable noise inside a room in order to meet this criteria. And so as you go across this frequency spectrum, what THX does is make sure that the noise inside the room is not getting above these levels. This can be noise generated by projector fans, it can be noise from HVAC, noise from any number of things. You want your room to be quiet and as noise free as possible except for the speakers. So selecting components for a home theater computer with quietness in mind is our primary concern. 
Now next, our home theater needs to be as dark as possible. Now while not necessarily authoritative, there is a thread on the AVS forum called the blacker the theater, the better the image. And this thread is filled with a whole bunch of posts from home theater enthusiasts trying to get their theater room to be as dark as possible in order to maximize picture quality. The reason for this is because in a home theater environment, we're normally dealing with front projection. And so the only light we want hitting the screen is light that is coming directly from the projector's lens. Any light illuminating the screen that is not from the projector is going to decrease the contrast and overall quality of our image. You may have noticed when you're in a commercial theater, they have the exit lighting there that is mandated by law, and sometimes it, ca it casts a slight red hue on the screen. Well, that is decreasing the contrast of the screen inside the commercial theater. That can't be avoided. But in a home theater, you don't have to follow ambient lighting laws, and so you can have your theater be as dark as possible. And because of this, it is easy with the right projector to achieve image quality that is going to be far superior to the commercial cinema. Now to this end, we don't want our home theater computer to be an emitter of light. Now with gaming computers these days, RGB or red, green, blue lighting is all the rage and people have all these flashy lights and they have windows in their computers so they can see all the components inside there. In a home theater, we don't want this because it's going to be light that's going to possibly be distracting and it's also going to be light that could be shining on our screen and is decreasing the quality of our image. Now, it may not be possible to find the components you want that don't have RGB lighting, especially if you're building a gaming computer for home theater PCs, but we can mitigate this by choosing a case that does not have a side panel window. Or you can find components that allow you to turn off the lighting. Now, the next criteria is your home theater computer should be capable of 4K video playback. Now, fortunately, if you're purchasing current generation hardware, this is not going to be an issue because video playback is actually one of the easier things we can ask a computer to do. Now the fourth thing you're going to want is the ability to playback physical media. And so in the case of UHD Blu-rays, you'll need to get a UHD Blu-ray drive. And these drives are backwards compatible, so UHD Blu-ray drive will also be able to play Blu-rays, DVDs, CDs, and all that stuff. Maybe not Super Audio CDs and some of the more fringe formats, but it's generally going to be backwards compatible with most common formats. Okay, so let's get into the nitty gritty of component selection, and this is going to start with case selection. Building a quiet PC starts with the case. And this is one instance where you don't necessarily want to find the smallest form factor case you can get. You're going to want a larger case that's going to support larger diameter fans that can spin at lower RPMs because they're quieter. You also want to see if you can find a case that has noise dampening panels included. And finally, you want a case that does not have a side panel window because of lighting reasons. So first, try to find a case that has sound dampening material inside. This is going to dampen any sound from fans and hard drives inside the case. Avoid cases that only support small fans. Small fans have to spin faster to get the same amount of air movement, and so they're going to be louder. Also, choose a case that does not have a side panel window. If you have any components inside your case that have RGB lighting on it that can't be turned off, not having a side panel window will keep all that light inside your case. Now, if you plan to game with your home theater computer, you also want to make sure that the case you get is large enough to support the graphics card that you want to get. Also, if you want to splurge on water cooling, make sure that the case you get is going to support the radiators that you're also going to want to put inside the case. Now the next major design consideration is fans. You want your fans to be large enough so that they can spin at low RPMs while still moving the air that is required to keep your PC nice and cool. Now in the case of quiet computer fans, the conversation really ends with a brand called Noctua. Now these fans are a little bit pricey, they generally cost about $30 a piece. But if you look up any article on what are the quietest computer fans, Noctua is always at the top of the list. Now there are other brands that do make fans that are quiet, so you'll have to do research to make sure that the fans are going to be nice and quiet. Or you can just buy Noctua and be done with it. Now for your CPU fan, if the CPU you get actually comes with a heatsink and fan, throw it in the garbage. 
you'll want to buy an aftermarket cooling solution for your CPU. Now, if you plan to game with your home theater PC, and especially if you want to overclock it, then you're probably going to want to investigate water cooling solutions. Water cooling is a very efficient way to remove heat from your CPU and also your graphics card. They do make all-in-one water cooling solutions that has a pump and it also has a radiator with one or more large fans on it so that you can keep your CPU cool under really heavy loads with minimal noise. Just make sure to do your research because sometimes the pumps can have a little bit of noise involved with them. So make sure to read multiple reviews that do measure the noise that is generated by the pumps. So ideally the pumps will be silent. Now, if you plan to game with your home theater PC, you might want to consider water cooling a graphics card also. A graphics card is generally not going to be under heavy load while just playing back video. So better designed graphics cards are actually not going to spin their fans up at high speeds while just playing back video. But while you're gaming, then the cards are going to spin their fans up and it may generate a little bit of noise. So if you're okay with a little bit of noise while you're gaming, then you don't have to worry as much about this. But if you want the absolute most silent experience possible, then you probably want to investigate a graphics card that also has a built-in water cooling solution or possibly purchasing an aftermarket water cooling solution to cool your graphics card. Just be aware that if you install an aftermarket water cooling solution on your graphics card, most graphics card manufacturers are not going to honor the warranty. Next, we'll look at power supply selection. When choosing a power supply, make sure the power supply has a large fan that is also fairly quiet. One feature that you'll want to look for is a power supply that will actually shut the fan off under low loads. Now an example of this is the higher end Corsair power supply, specifically the AX, HX, RM, and SF series. These have what they call a zero RPM mode, which will actually turn the fan off when the power supply is not under heavy load. When playing back movies, like I said, this isn't very demanding on a PC, so generally this fan will not even come on when watching movies, and this is what we want because a fan that's not moving is a fan that's silent. But of course, when, you, when the computer is under heavy load, like when you're gaming, then the fan is going to spin up. So we'll want to make sure that the fan is also quiet while it is moving. Another consideration is to get a power supply that is more than you need. A larger power supply is going to have larger heat sinks in it, and so it's going to be able to give you more power before the fan has to start spinning on it. Now, you don't have to go crazy and get a 1200 watt power supply but just get a power supply that is more than you need. That way there's less chance that the fan will actually have to start spinning up on it and generating unwanted noise. So now we'll move on to motherboard selection. Now in choosing a motherboard, be careful if you're getting a high-end motherboard because some of them include active chipset cooling. This comes in the form of a small fan on the chipset that will keep the chipset cool under heavier loads. Small fans, when they are running, tend to be noisy fans, and we don't want this. So if at all possible, get a motherboard that does not have a fan on it. Now, I don't know of any Intel motherboards that have active cooling on them, but the higher-end AMD motherboards, specifically the ones with the X570 chipset, do have active cooling on them. Now, there is an exception. There is one particularly high-end motherboard that costs $600 that does not have a fan. It has all passive cooling. And it also has fan control and sound monitoring to monitor the sound in your computer if you want to be dead silent, but it is at a very hefty premium. Another consideration when buying a motherboard is make sure that it has at least one M.2 NVMe slot. This is a slot for a solid state drive that we will use as a boot drive for our home theater PC. Also make sure it has enough available serial ATA connectors to connect however many mechanical hard drives you're going to want to put inside your home theater computer. And how many hard drives you want is going to depend on your storage needs. And I'll talk a little bit more about this in the hard drive selection section. Now, when it comes to CPU selection, video playback is not that demanding on modern CPUs. Now, if you are going to be gaming with your home theater computer, the simple answer is to get the most powerful graphics card that you can afford. Now, the more complex answer is you need to decide, are you fine gaming at 1080? and having the projector upscale that to 4K, or do you want to game natively at 4K? Graphics card that can give you good frame rates at 1080p are not too terribly expensive, maybe two or $300. 
graphics cards that can give you good frame rates at 4K are going to be a lot more expensive. Think $500 and uh, probably more like $700 and up. Now for the purposes of this video, we want to select a graphics card that is going to give us the power we want while not sounding like a vacuum cleaner inside our home theater. And so look for a graphics card that has large heat sink and large fans. Also look for features that will shut the fans off under low loads when they aren't necessary. And if you want to be as quiet as possible while gaming, then you can look for cards that have integrated water cooling solutions. And you're also, of course, going to pay a premium for something like that. Now let's talk about the sound card you'll need for a home theater computer. You actually don't need a sound card. You don't even have to worry about the quality of the integrated audio on your motherboard. With a home theater computer, we're going to be bit streaming the actual digital data from the movie through our HDMI connection to our audio video receiver. This all happens in the digital realm and it's not going to impact the sound quality. What will impact the sound quality is the quality of your other components such as your audio video receiver, your speakers, maybe your amplifiers and anything else you have. So now we come to optical drive selection. Now the drive that you select for UHD Blu-ray playback will depend on whether or not you want to back up your physical media onto your home theater computer. Now for general playback, any UHD Blu-ray drive will work. But if you do want to back up your physical media to your computer, there are some considerations for which drives are going to work for this purpose. And you're going to want to head over to makemkv.com. There's a thread there that's going to tell you what drives you can get and how you can get them set up. It involves reflashing the BIOS with custom BIOS to get around copy protection restrictions. Now, as far as memory selection goes, the minimum amount of memory I'd recommend for a home theater PC or any PC for that matter is eight gigabytes. But ideally, I'd feel much more comfortable with 16 gigabytes of RAM. Now for timings, you don't need super fast timings. Just get whatever the default timings are for your motherboard and you'll be fine. If you're trying to game and overclock with your computer, then you're probably going to want faster timings and you're going to know about this stuff because you're an overclocker. Now more memory than 16 gigabytes is going to be overkill unless you're planning to do more advanced stuff like video editing and content creation and stuff like that. So now let's talk about hard drives. The hard drives you get are going to depend on whether or not you want to back up your physical media onto your home theater computer. Now whether or not you do this, your boot drive should be an M.2 NVMe solid state drive. This will ensure that your home theater PC boots up quickly and the overall user experience is going to be much more responsive and snappy. Now as far as size is concerned, if you're just using your home theater PC to watch movies, a 128GB solid state drive is more than enough to install Windows and whatever media player software that you want to have on your computer. But if you plan to game, then you're going to want a larger solid state drive because you're going to want to install games onto your fast solid state drive. And games take up a lot of memory, so you want to look at something more like a maybe one terabyte, maybe a two terabyte solid state drive or more, depending on when you're watching this video. Now for mechanical hard drives, if you're backing up your physical media onto your home theater PC, speed is not an issue. In fact, you want slower mechanical drives. Don't get 7200 RPM drives for your home theater computer because they're going to be louder because of, because of the simple fact that they're spinning faster. Actually look for 5400 RPM drives because since they're spinning slower, they're going to generate less noise. And the drives I have, I actually can't hear at all inside my computer. Now these drives will be slower, but they will be more than fast enough to give you smooth 4K video playback and even 8K video playback once that time comes. Now as far as the size of mechanical hard drive you need, it's going to depend on how much of your physical library you want to back up onto your home theater computer. Now a dual layer DVD can store up to 8.5 gigabytes of data. A Blu-ray can store up to 50 gigabytes and a UHD Blu-ray can store up to 100 gigabytes of data. Now once you actually copy the movie, the actual file is going to be smaller than this, but these are worst case scenario numbers. So to determine how much hard drive you need, you basically need to multiply each media by how much of it you have. So for example, if you have 100 DVDs, 50 Blu-rays, and 20 UHD Blu-rays, at the worst case, you're going to need about 5.35 terabytes of hard drive to store all those movies. 
However, you're also going to want to consider that you're going to acquire more movies as time goes on, so you want to leave a little bit of wiggle room to have more space for those. Now, another consideration is if you want to have your library mirrored onto two hard drives. What this is, is a RAID 1 array, and the reason you might want to do this is because, depending on the size of your movie library, it's probably going to take you a week or more to copy everything onto a hard drive. Well, if something catastrophic happens and you have a hard drive fail, you're going to have to do that all over again. However, if you have a RAID 1 array, which basically copies all the data identically onto two hard drives, if one fails, you still have everything on the other hard drive. Another option is to get a large external hard drive and store that somewhere else so that if something catastrophic happens, like your computer gets stolen or your house burns down or something like that, you still have your library on a separate hard drive. The only downside to that is you have to remember to periodically connect it to your computer and make sure that it is completely up to date with your newest content that you've acquired. Another reason for having a backup of your media library is because if you do have to recopy everything, you might find that one of the physical disks that your kids have been using has gotten damaged beyond readability and you would have to repurchase that one in order to recopy it. Now, if you want to build a totally silent home theater PC, you could opt to have all solid state drives in your computer. However, solid state drives cost more per terabyte than a mechanical hard drive. Now, as of the time of this video, you can get a four terabyte solid state drive for about $480. Or for $400, you can get a 16 terabyte mechanical hard drive. Now, if you're watching this video a few years into the future, then maybe an all solid state drive home theater computer is a more viable option. But right now, you're going to get a lot more terabytes with a mechanical hard drive than with a solid state hard drive. All right, now let's talk a little bit about input devices. Using a traditional mouse and keyboard on a home theater computer is going to be a bit of a clunky solution. Even a wireless keyboard and mouse combination is going to be a bit clunky. So you're gonna to wanna to look for something like a keyboard that has a touchpad integrated into it so you have a nice compact solution. Now this is a Logitech KR400. Logitech also makes a nicer K830 keyboard, which is actually backlit. And a backlit keyboard would be nice to have inside a home theater so that we can actually see what we're typing in a dark environment. Of course, we wanna make sure that that backlight can turn off so that we're not generating unwanted light when we're not actually using the keyboard. Now, if you just want a mouse pointer, Logitech also makes a spotlight presentation remote. I haven't actually used this personally, but it looks like it would work as a pointer so you can just kind of point and click your way through your home theater computer without having to bother with a keyboard. Next, which operating system should you use? Well, since this is a home theater PC, you're probably gonna to wanna to be using Windows. Now you can use Linux for home theater PC and all the programs that you need also come in Linux versions if you're into Linux. And you can also use a Mac as a home theater PC or I guess it would be a home theater Mac. All the software is available for them but because it's a Mac your hardware options are much more limited. Now people do use Mac minis as home theater computers but they're smaller and have little fans that could generate unwanted noise during movie playback. And so now we come to what media software you're going to want to use. Now for streaming online content, your best bet is to get the app if there's an app available. For example, you can view Netflix through Chrome or Internet Explorer, but you're going to get a better experience if you actually get the dedicated Netflix app because the Netflix app is going to support surround sound and HDR playback whereas browser playback may not support surround sound and all the more advanced features. Now the playback media files, I like to use the Kodi Media Center. Kodi is a free program that will look at your media library and will actually get the posters for it and it'll display it in a very user-friendly format so you can easily browse through it. This is a much nicer format than actually just going through Windows Explorer and browsing through all the movies that way because, well, look, that doesn't look very good whereas Kodi looks much more polished and shiny and kind of more like almost a Netflix experience. Kodi also supports playback of formats such as Dolby True HD, DTS Master Audio, uh, Dolby Atmos, DTS X, and it also supports video, audio, and picture formats in pretty much any format. 
Now for media ripping, you're probably going to want to back up copies of movies that you own onto your home theater computer. For movies that you do own, there are several good reasons to back them up onto your home theater computer. The first is convenience. If you play back a movie from a physical disc, you have to load the disc, wait for the disc to load, you have to sit through the menus, possibly previews that you can't skip, you have to sit through the FBI warning, the Interpol warning, the Interpol warning in French, and then you can finally get to the movie. But if you copy just the movie onto your home theater computer, you basically just click on the movie and the movie starts with all that, without all that extra hassle. Now there's a couple software packages available for copying your media onto your home theater computer. The one that I like to use is a program called MakeMKV. MakeMKV will copy movies onto your computer in a bit perfect one-to-one -one format. What this means is that the movie copied onto your computer is not going to be compressed any way. It can retain the full resolution of the movie, it's not going to compress it at all, and it'll also retain the Dolby 2 HD or Dolby Atmos or whichever soundtrack you want to have as part of that movie file. The advantage of copying a movie one-to-one -one is that there's not going to be any loss of visual or audio quality, which is going to be important if you're watching this movie on a 130-inch home theater screen. Because if you are watching a compressed movie on a screen this large, then that compression can be evident. Now, of course, the disadvantage is that each movie file is going to be fairly large, up to 50 gigabytes for a Blu-ray, although most Blu-rays I've copied have been in the 20 to 30 gigabyte range. Now, the file that make MKV outputs is a MKV file, which is a Matroska video. MKV files are widely supported by a large variety of media players, and if you put them onto a USB thumb drive, most modern TVs that have USB inputs will play an MKV file just fine. The downside of an MKV file is it does not retain any of the menu structures or special features from the disk that you're copying it from. Now you can copy the special features individually, but you want to keep those in a separate directory so that your media player like Kodi doesn't get confused by all the extra files. Now an alternative to make MKV is a program called DVDFab. What this program does is it actually copies the entire disc into an ISO format. That way when you play the disc back, you get the menus, you get the special features, you get the FBI warning, you get the Interpol warning, and all that extra stuff that's on the disc. It's going to be a larger format, but if the special features are important for you and you want to retain that directory structure, then DVD Fab might be the option that you might prefer. Now DVD Fab will also allow you to compress the video files into a smaller format so that you can store more files on your hard drive. Of course, the disadvantage of this is if you compress it a lot, then there's going to be compression artifacts that are going to be evident on a 130 inch screen, and it's also generally going to have stereo sound. If you've invested $20,000 into an 11.4 Atmos setup, you're probably not going to want to compress your video files into a stereo format. But if you want to take your movies along with you on the go so you can watch them on a laptop or on your phone while you're traveling or on a plane or something, then that might be a feature that you're interested in. Now, a free alternative to DVD Fab, because DVD Fab does cost money, there is a program called Handbrake. Handbrake can take MKV files and it can also compress them into smaller video formats. That way, if you don't want to put an entire 40 gigabyte 4K movie on your phone, you can run it through Handbrake and it'll compress it into a much smaller format where there is going to be compression artifacts that are visible on a 130 inch screen, but if you're viewing it on a phone or a small laptop screen, then it's not going to be as evident and you're going to be able to take more movies with you on the go. Or you can just get a ridiculously ginormous external hard drive and call it good. So there it is. That's all the design considerations and things that you're going to want to think about if you want to build a home theater computer. It needs to be quiet, ideally silent. You don't want to have a bunch of lights and stuff on it that are going to be reflecting off the screen. You want it to be capable of 4K video playback, and you want it to be able to read physical discs so that you can play back physical media or copy them onto hard drives inside your home theater PC for the sake of convenience. So thank you for making it all the way to the end of this video. Here's some other videos that I've made that you might be interested in all stuff home theater and maybe some other stuff that YouTube thinks you might be interested also on my channel. So there it is.
thanks for watching. And all there's like buttons and bells and stuff down there also that you can check out and subscribe and all that.